Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our watering can project. Ooh. Ooh. We have Michael here working the cameras. Hello. Who's my husband. And um, we will be doing this project in five steps. So our very first step is we are going to paint the wash on our watering can. Our second step is we will start to put in the shadows on our watering can to give it some form. Um, our third step is we will start to put in our parsley leaves. Our fourth step is do more leaves, kind of fill this out. And our very last step is just shadows and any finishing details. All right? Love it. All right, I am using four colors for this project. So my very first color is lemon yellow. And then we have honey brown. And then we have Tahoe blue. And our very last color is Payne's Gray. Now this is our in-house paint, uh, which is a liquid watercolor. It's dye based, which means it's very, very vibrant. Um, it's a lot of fun. I like this paint. All right. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. I have the outline already transferred to my paper using graphite paper. Um, I'm using Holbein soft tape and I am using all four of our paint brushes. We have a round two, round six, round 12, and one inch wash. If you are just starting out with watercolor and you're like, do I need all four of those? I would just start out with the two and a six. And then as you go, add these other two to your arsenal. Oh my gosh, arsenal. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. Jesse <laughs> came up with that. <laughs> um, let's do our oath and then let's get to painting. Raise your right hand. And repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. And I love starting that way because sometimes we forget that the whole point of creating something is the joy of creating. And we get in our heads and we're kind of looking at other people and we're looking at who we're trying to and we're just like getting mad because it's not looking the same. That's not what this is about. I'm not interested in you painting something that looks exactly like what I paint. I want you to just have fun, okay? All right. Or don't, it's your life. Or don't, it's your life. <laughs> it's true. Okay, so I'm gonna start with my step one, which is putting in my wash. And I want to use, you can use a larger brush. You can either use your one inch wash or your round 12. I'm gonna use my one inch. No, my round 12, sorry. I'm gonna mix some of this Tahoe blue with my Payne's gray. Why did you choose that? I just saw the gears turning in your head. Why did you pick that one? So the reason why I chose this one is because I want to do a rough brush stroke texture to get that kind of weird patina on like tin. Mm -hmm. And I want my brush, my one inch wash to be dry for that. Mm -hmm. So I decided to use this. It's not what the round 12 provides you. It's because I wanted to use this for something else. Got you. But you can do vice versa. You could do the brush, dry brush stroke with the 12 and do this part with the one. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, so it creates this like really pretty like navy blue color. And I'm gonna add some water to that to lighten it up. I'm gonna add a little bit more of the Payne's Gray to kind of desaturate that color. And we're going for this kind of color here, okay? Elephant skin. <laughs> That's the technical term, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna grab some water, I'm gonna pick up this light value, and then I'm just gonna start dropping in the color. And again, when we're putting in washes on things that have like an uneven finish, um, it's okay if your wash is not perfectly smooth. So I'm kind of doing like loose brush strokes. I'm fine if there's like a darker value here or there. It is not the end of the world and I'm not being too precise. We're also gonna do a couple layers. So we're kind of just, the point of this is just to put down the color. The other nice thing about using a round for something like this is because I can control the tip a lot easier than a one inch wash. So when I'm doing these curved lines, that's where you're gonna wanna use like a round brush, whatever one you feel comfortable using. So I'm just gonna curve that. And if you can, try and do this in one stroke. It's 
it's not easy. So don't get upset if you can't, but sometimes it's just easier to control the smoothness of a line if you just do it in one go than trying to stop and start. Now when I get to the top of this guy up here, I want to make sure that my darker value is going to be on the this part here. And you can even leave some small white spaces for the little holes. And then it's going to really lighten up at the edge. And we'll go in and darken it more, but just for that initial layer. Okay, that's step one. Good job. Yeah, piece of cake. Piece of cake. Now we're going to move on to step two. We're going to start adding some shadows and things like that to give this form. So whenever you're trying to make something three-dimensional or have it pop off the page, it's important to have a range of values. Values is the lightness and darkness of a color. And it is, like, for me, the most important aspect when it comes to learning the technicalities of painting. If you can understand values, seeing them, replicating them, and creating them, then you can paint or draw whatever you want. It, that is what gives something dimension and form. That's also why I don't focus too much on color because for me, color is more um, in tune with who you are as an artist. That's more stylistic preferences um, and artistic preferences where I feel like understanding values is really where it's at in creating something that feels like it's popping off the page. Now there's different ranges of which you add value because like illustration style usually tends to be a little bit more flat um, and a little bit more like playful. Photorealism is like you're trying to make it as three-dimensional as possible and there's everything in between. So I like to do ranges of projects that are illustrative or more realistic because then you guys can decide as you're learning these things what you like. And it's okay to like many things. It's okay to like something different than someone else. It's all okay. You're doing it right. You're, you're doing good. Sometimes you just need to be told that you're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. You stop that. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna basically just grab a little bit more paint than what I mixed previously. That's how we get a darker value in watercolor. You just add more paint. So when you look at outlines, you can see here that I like to do hash marks wherever there are shadows. You don't have to trace those in. It's just a visual reminder of that's where some darker values are going to go. So when we get to this step of adding in the shadow, I'm going to refer back to that and start putting in the shadows. So there's some kind of coming underneath. Now, as I'm putting in the shadow, I'm like, wow, the value difference between this and this is actually pretty drastic. You see how they feel separate from each other? Um, that's because the I skipped values too much. Does that make sense? This one's too light and that one's really dark. So whenever that happens, you just take some water and just blend. Blend it out. Lift up some of that color. Because sometimes having values that are too drastic next to each other um, tends to create more a feeling of flatness than if you didn't add any value at all. Does that make sense? Okay. So that feels a little bit better. There is a darker value on this ledge here. Okay. There's the shadow of the handle. So you see this kind of part right here. Let me move my head so you guys can actually see it. And you can do this with a six or a two if you want. Just trying to show the kind of underside part of that handle. And sometimes if your line gets a little bit curved, you gotta straighten it out so it doesn't look like a wonky watering can. Okay. Then the handle itself also has some darker values. So kind of 
underneath. Now, usually whenever you're painting a rounded object, like this part, the spout is rounded, the edges are going to be a darker value because they're turning away from us. And so that light is kind of moving away from us. And so the center, we want to keep that lighter value because that's where that light is hitting. And the edges are going to be a slightly darker. But again, we don't want it to feel drastic. So I like to use just a damp brush and kind of blend all of it out. And then underneath here, and on the top spout part itself, so we're going to go in and darken that edge. Lifting up my brush here and there for some little white holes. And then you're kind of just going to softly blend that out into the light value. Okay. So uh, I want to call attention to two things. One, my brush went a little rogue right here and I have this one little light gray area that's sticking out from the spout. I'm going to let that dry and then I can go back and because that's such a light value, I should be able to lift it out with just some clean water, but I don't want to do that yet. I want to give everything else a chance to dry for a second so I don't adjust the line too much. And then this guy also is sticking out a little bit too much. You see that right there, but I'm going to be putting in a shadow later. So I'm actually not even going to leave that because most likely that's just going to blend out when I do my shadow. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some of that like unfinished, like that rough texture that you get when you're looking at that kind of metal. So I'm going to take my one inch and I'm going to pick up, if you want it to be more gray, you can pick up that paint's gray color. Um, sometimes it has like a sheen of like a little bit of like, like we have some here. Depending on what colors are around it, sometimes it has like hints of green or warm or whatever. So if you want to add other color in here, you can. I'm going to stay within this like gray blue. The term you're looking for is oxidation. Oh, okay. It's on iron, it's rust. On other metals, they all have their own names. But it's metal oxidizing. So we're going to try and paint that oxida oxidation. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna use this rough brush and I'm gonna kind of go sideways and up and down. Cool. And you see how you get this kind of imperfect texture finish? That's kind of what we want. And I want you to play with that. And if you would rather do this using your round brush, you can. I actually like to use variations of brushes because it just like tends to adjust your brush stroke mark. Like if you use the same brush for it all, then your marks tend to be the same size. And I like variation in my mark making. Hear me out, this just came to me. Would this work like a new dry dish scrubber? You know that like, the rough side of a dish scrubber? I want to say yes. That'd be cool. That would be cool. I love using like random objects for texture. It is so fun. Um, so if you have a clean dish scrubber, don't like scrub your paper though, cause your paper will rip. But yeah, if you want to play with a sponge, if you want to play with, um, saran wrap, if you want to play with whatever bubble wrap, these are all like fun ways. So now I'm doing the round 12 on top of it. See how they're much different marks. That's what we want. We want there to be that range of mark making. Overall, we want to keep the right hand side a little bit lighter in value than the left hand side. Maybe I'll do one little right there and I feel like I need to do a little bit darker edge along the bottom then dry brush that up 
Yeah, isn't that texture just so good? Oh, I love it. When you oxidize something, um, it's burning it. When you light a fire, you're oxidizing wood. But oxygen in the air is so reactive that it actually slow burns metal. So when you see something rusting, it's actually burning away very slowly. What? So the textures you're seeing, and if you look at them up close, are like, there's metal missing. It's burning it away very slowly. What? Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. Okay, so that feels good to me. And now I'm going to go to my handle. Um, some of my shadow kind of blend it out too much, so I'm just gonna put some of that back in. And you can do some of this rough dry brush texture on that as well. Now, let's say that you're trying to do that dry brush texture, but it's coming on smooth. That just means you're picking up too much water with your brush. Um, so if you still want if you to help you, just grab some paint and hit it on the paper towel. The paper towel will soak up any excess water or paint. And so then when you go, you're really having a dry brush. It's also possible, sometimes your paper is so wet that even when you try and put a dry brush down there, the paint just diffuses out evenly. Um, so if that's the case, just pick up some of that water on your paper and then you'll be able to do that dry brush texture. Okay, so cute. <laughs> this is such a cute, I feel like watering cans are just like the cutest little, little things. Okay, I'm gonna darken some of that. I looked it up before we filmed, but watering cans were actually invented and patented. Really? It's funny to think that something like that was like invented, but it was, it's from London. It's cute. Now, as someone, I'm not a gardener. I'm just learning how to keep plants alive, but I'm doing okay. The doing plants great. in my studio have been alive for a year. They're doing great. Um, but would you say like the spout shape matters when it comes to watering plants? Like how it's like rain as opposed to just like a solid pour or does that not matter as no, much? Absolutely. Water is uh, very heavy. Yeah. And a lot of plant parts are very delicate. So if you have a strong spray, yeah. Just, you'd rip up your flower parts, you'd rip up your leaves. Oh, so also, it's like a gentle... Yeah, also some plants don't like having water, like the one I think of is African violets, don't like being wet on top. So you're supposed to water them essentially from the bottom, you like soak them in something. Okay. But anyways, back to your question, yeah, you want a gentle rain-like flow so you're not tearing up the actual vegetative matter of your plant. Okay, that's good to know because that is not how I water my plants. <laughs> I do like straight pitcher of water on top of them. Maybe I should not do it well, that. Well, I mean, you don't really have any delicate plants Yeah, that's here. true. My, my plants are hardy. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be. <laughs> okay, and I'm just going to do one little dark edge along this lip. Gosh, I love the texture that I got on that so much. Now on this lighter value where you're like, okay, I know we want to keep it a lighter value, but we want to add texture to that. How do I do that? You can still absolutely add that dry brush texture. You just would make sure that you are picking up a tiny, tiny amount of paint to keep that value light and then hit it on your paper towel. And let's see, too light. It's not showing up at all. Let's try this. Back to this oxidation talk, um, something like a watering can is made out of galvanized metal. Have you heard that word before? Galvanized. That's the word I've been looking for. Yeah, essentially what galvanized is. Okay, so like the main metal in a watering can is iron. Iron is the main metal in most silver colored things. And okay. Iron rusts that rusty red color. Okay? Yes. So to keep it from doing that, you mix it with other metals and then you do something called galvanizing, which is essentially you shock it really hard. A galvanic reaction is like you electrocute it. Okay. What electrocuting it does is essentially pre-burns it. 
so that when you put it out in the mm. wild, the oxygen can't really get to it because there's an outside layer that's been pre-burnt. Okay, okay, so that's what we're painting here is like a galvanized... Yeah, metal. Metal. It still reacts over time, and you can see an old, old, old watering can starts to, like, you know, lose it. I am just darkening. I'm just, like, tightening up this shadow that I added onto the handle using my round two. Watering cans remind me of my mom. Yeah. Your mom has a great little garden. One day I'll be that person. I've decided it. I'm not there yet, but I one day I'm going to have a glorious garden. It's going to be beautiful. I get high hopes about a garden, and I plant them, and then the squirrels just feast on my tomatoes, and the neighbor kids. Yeah, the neighbors do eat our tomatoes, but that's okay. <laughs> He's so cute doing He's it. He's so I, cute. I just let him do it. We're like, why don't we have any tomatoes? And then we saw him just eating them like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was step one and two. And um, love how it's turning out. You can always go back and darken some areas. Remember that watercolor tends to lighten as it dries. So if your watering can is still wet, as it dries, you're gonna like go back to it and see, are my values where I want them to be? And you are free to make adjustments at any time. We're gonna move on to step three where we're gonna start adding our parsley leaves. Now I just want to encourage you and remind you that this is your painting and maybe you don't like parsley. And maybe you wanna paint this for someone who really likes carrots or um, another thing that can go inside your <laughs> sack. <laughs> <laughs> Flowers. <laughs> Flowers, you know, anything that you want. Um, it's just parsley or carrots, that's it. But we're gonna do parsley. Parsley is actually one of my favorite herbs to put when I'm, when I'm cooking. Um, and I wanted to get some from our store, but our local grocery store didn't have parsley. They had cilantro. So I brought cilantro. It looks very similar to they do. parsley. They do look similar, but they're different. I love cilantro too. Oh, cilantro is probably my... Mm. Cilantro and parsley are my favorite. Basil. Basil is third for me. What? I know. Okay. So I'm going to take my round six and you are free to look at these if you need help like with the shape of the leaves, but just know that parsley leaves um, are a little bit sharper. See how these are rounded with, uh, what was that word did you use? Toothy. Toothy. Um, I feel like parsley leaves kind of remind me of fingers a little bit. They're a little bit longer. I could be imagining them wrong, but that's what I think of. Also, you're talking about flat parsley because there yes. is curly parsley too. We're not doing curly parsley. We're doing flat parsley. Or is that Italian parsley? I don't know which one's which. I don't know that's either. Why, <laughs> that's why we avoided saying that <laughs> and I brought it. I think Italian's flat. Okay. So I'm going to mix some greens. I'm going to take my Tahoe blue. That's the blue I'm using, right? Yep. And lemon yellow for this really vibrant green. I'm going to take some Tahoe blue and some honey brown for a deeper green, kind of more like a foresty green. And then I like to add a little bit of extra blue here and there. So then I have a full range. I have like a turquoisey green, I have a warm green, I have a cool green. You can even add some Payne's gray and get like this really dark green. We want the full range here. Used ethically sourced paints and have a green green. <laughs> Dad jokes, level five. That was good. Okay, so now I'm going to put in some of the, the leaves. I'm going to take my round six. I'm going to grab some green, and I'm going to just do this kind of flat, that stroke. So it's more like, let me get a scratch paper so I can break it down. So it's basically just thin strokes where the bottoms connect and kind of come out of. They might be like grass tufts. Yeah. Yeah. And then if it's like, f like facing, it's going to be thicker with the edges. And then if it's turned on its side, it's going to be nice and thin. So just kind of play with these different angles and marks. Dang, I really wish I had some parsley <laughs> so then I can make sure that I'm doing this correctly. Somewhere okay. out there, some parsley looks like that. So don't worry about it. That's true. It's nature. You know, there is some 
wonky stuff everywhere. And I am gonna be switching up the colors of my greens as I'm putting this in here. So I don't want you to feel like your leaves all have to be the same hue and the same value. We actually don't want that. We want some to be light. We want some to be dark. We want some to be more blue. And I'm, um, I'm just kind of imagining them coming out. I'm gonna do some more yellowy ones. So when you're putting these in, I want you to think about what direction do you want your um, herbs to be going? Do you want them to be straight up? Do you want it to feel like it's overflowing, like going around? Do you want it to feel like it's leaning all on one side? And then that's gonna inform you where you put these leaves and the angle at which you put them. For me, I want it to feel like this, like it's all spray, like sprayed out. Okay a bouquet of it. Um, but depending on what you're painting, that might not work. Where maybe if you're doing lavender or something like that, you can have it splayed out or you can have it like a strong angle, like it's leaning against here and it's just all these stems going this way. So I'm saying that in the way of just think about the direction you want, the feel you want it to be, and then um, paint accordingly. So you can see I have some that are going to be angled this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And that's how we get that kind of splayed out feeling. Okay, that's a good start. And now what I'm going to do is I want it to feel very, very full. And so when we do just individual leaves like this, it still is white around it, which makes it feel empty. So to make it feel full, we actually do a green wash. So I'm just gonna use water and around this center here, I'm just gonna pull color from the leaves that are around it. And now I'm gonna drop in different greens and just kind of let them move. I don't want an even wash. I'm not working it back and forth. I'm letting the color move around the water and do the work for me. And then as it gets kind of more up here to the top, I'm gonna to use more just clean water because we want the values to lighten because when it is thick and there's layers and layers and layers, it's gonna be so green. And then as the layers, like as it thins out, as it gets to the top, we wouldn't have such a dark green background, right? Because there's not as many layered on top of each other. So I'm gonna like, transition it out by doing a lighter value here, okay? And then we're gonna let that dry. I'm gonna use this to dry it. Let's say, I'll leave that. Let's say that you added all the paints and all this stuff and it kind of just became this really dark color. The whole thing became really dark and you didn't have any value changes. What you can do to bring some light back in there is actually just take your water, clean, well, mostly clean water, and kind of drop it in the super dark areas or wherever you want there to be a little bit more light let it sit for a second and then take a clean paper towel and lift. And you see all that paint. I mean, it doesn't erase it, but it lightens it to the point where you can get like a highlight back in there, okay? That's only if yours didn't have any of that value shift and it all became one really dark thing. Okay, now I'm gonna take my round two and I'm gonna start putting in the stems and start kind of defining um, my parsley a little bit more. So I'm gonna do my trick of pinching the top so it's nice and a thin line. And I can go off what I've already painted and just kind of start adding stems. 
And now I'm going to think about how far out do I want this to be? Do I want this to feel taller than this? Do I want it to feel fuller? So using these stems, these will be your guides of kind of like how things are going to go, where things are going to go in this. And notice that I'm kind of playing with the angles. So it's going da, 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 da. And it does overlap. That's why we left this handle so light in value and this edge. It gives us freedom to kind of like add parsley on top. Okay, now that we've added some stems, we can add more leaves. And I know cilantro is different, but I just want you to pay attention to how many different little heads come off of one, you know? And if your center is dry, you can paint on top of that as well. If it's still wet, I would suggest just waiting till that dries. So then your marks can stay nice and sharp. And think about how limp <laughs> they can be too, right? So sometimes it's really strong and full and sometimes it like, just like, False. The terms are turgid and flaccid. Is turgid strong? Turgid is full of water. Okay. So you guys can choose how turgid or flaccid your herbs are, right? Right. So I'm going to do a mix of both because I kind of like the limp look. I think that's funny. So I'm just going to boop. You could probably pop that cilantro in uh, some water and throw it in the fridge and it might regain some of its uh, life turgidness yeah i heard i've um i've heard that where if it's just like just pop it in some water i feel like i saw like some instagram hack where if you take your herbs and you just put them in jars of water and then put them in your fridge they last like way longer or in a ziploc with like a damp paper towel they'll last forever oh really oh yeah the moisture loss in your fridge is what kills your herbs the, the what? Moisture loss. Oh. Uh, think of like your air conditioner in your car. It dries you out. Right? Mm -hmm. A refrigerator is an air conditioner all the time. Mm. So everything in it just dries out. So if you keep it in a Ziploc with a moist paper towel, it retains its moisture. Okay. That makes sense. So basically, I'm just going to add more and more. I'm just keep going. I'm gonna to start to layer within down here now. You can add more stems. Remember, it doesn't have to be, oh, there's a stem going this way, so then my leaves have to go this way. It does not have to make sense. We just want variation in um, hues and values in this area. Sometimes, if and it, let's say like some of your parsley is looking a little too like spidery, like that looks like spider legs to me, you can just thicken it up and just make it one chunk. Now they're just chunky spiders. <laughs> That's right. So I, just, oh sorry. oh sorry, I was just gonna say, just keep adding until you feel good about how like full it feels. I was gonna say, as you know, I'm an animal lover. Mm -hmm. I do know this. But you know, and I try with spiders and I'm kind to them, but they freak me out. <laughs> yeah I wonder if people who like quote unquote like spiders are still kind of freaked out by them they have to be I don't know like I've owned a, a pet snake forever that we won in a raffle yep and this is a true story like for years you know but still she kind of freaks me out sometimes there's just, <laughs> there's just some animals I think that you're like I don't know about you I don't, I don't know spiders right. Okay, I'm gonna do some light value ones too because if we wanna give the illusion that there are some behind as well as some in front, then sometimes using a light value can um, like push something back and make it feel full, but still have, it kind of like separates the spaces. So the super dark ones can be in the front and then let's say, oh, but there's a piece of parsley back here in the back. Okay, let's make that a light value and that's just automatically gonna kind of like separate the planes 
just a little bit more. I'm gonna grab more yellow. And I'm gonna round out some of these, some of these um, parsley leaves that I painted. They just feel too sharp. Isn't that funny how like sharp edges like this can make something feel aggressive? <laughs> like I'm just like, I don't want to touch you. <laughs> it's prickly parsley. Yeah. So I'm just going to round out some of them, kind of soften that a bit. Not every single one, but some of them. And then this is where I'm going to start kind of also looking at composition. Do I feel happy about the feeling of it flowing out and around? Um, is there like a leaf I want to add here or there? I almost want a couple more reaching out. And I, I'm going to do these in a light value. A light value is a great way to activate space without totally um, messing with the composition. Like it doesn't draw your eye too much? Yeah. Listen, you're good at this. You should teach, you should teach this. <laughs> you guys can't, you don't know this, but uh, this entire studio smells like cilantro right now. It's all I can smell. <laughs> I'm happy with that because I like the smell of cilantro. Michael, not so much. Uh, I had my DNA tested because I never liked cilantro. I didn't have my DNA tested for the cilantro thing, but it turns out I have a gene that makes cilantro taste like soap. And that makes me so sad because I love the taste of cilantro and we never understood. I'm like, I don't understand why you don't like this. And then it's because he has the gene that makes it taste like soap. Well, listen, I love Mexican food so much that like, Salsa without cilantro tastes wrong mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. So I miss that soapy flavor sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then I think I want it to overlap kind of coming out of this a little bit more as if it's falling in the front too. And depending, like if there's like an area that's pretty light in value along this lip, Maybe that's where you can like have a leaf kind of coming forward. So let's try it. Maybe like um, this guy is just kind of overlapping a bit. Yeah, it feels good. But if this lip is too dark, then the green on top of it, you won't be able to see. So kind of look at your painting and decide what you think you can do. And then I'm just gonna blend this because that strong line was kind of throwing my eye bit. So you see how with that kind of wash in the background, it makes it feel very full right there. And because there's um, different values of light and dark, and we do like the stems and the leaves, it does have some separation. So it doesn't feel flat. And then as we get to the top, it thins out. And that's just where we see the tops, you know, not behind all of this other stuff. Okay, now we're going to move on to our last step, which is putting in the shadow. So I am going to take a round 12. What step do you put the googly eyes on it? <laughs> that would be so cute. <laughs> um, I also thought this would be a cute, like it would be easy to add like a last name right here in cursive oh, or something yeah. like that. You know, like you can write something on here, you can write garden, you can, I like this project because it's customizable to make it meaningful to you. And I love doing projects where that can happen. You know what would be cool also, and this is something I see on a real watering cans, is they have that kind of like embossed mm -hmm. stamp logo. Mm -hmm. You could do like, you know, try to make that embossed look so it looked like it was part of the metal. And if you're saying, how do I do that? Well, what you would do is basically if we're doing like garden, okay? So think of the word garden. Let's say it's cursive like that. And then if you want it to feel like it's embossed, the actual letters themselves would be a light value and you would be painting around it and slightly shading around the letters. Does that make sense? Cool. So I thought about actually adding that to this, but I was just like, that uh, seems complicated. But if you want a challenge, if you want to challenge, that's how I would do it. So basically the letters themselves are lifted up, which means they need to be a lighter value. And then along the edges, it's a darker value that then transitions to the wash of this. Okay. 
So for our shadow on our very last step here, I'm gonna take my round 12. I'm gonna grab a neutral. So I have some gray here from Payne's Gray. You can use that if you wanna grab a little bit of color you can because shadows have colors too. But I'm gonna try and keep it in the same vein as my can, sorry. <laughs> and I'm gonna make sure this is a light value. And then I'm just going to do horizontal brush strokes in the front here. Is that showing up? Yep, a little bit. Kind of let it be a little bit rough and loose. And then around the top here, it kind of make sure the shadow goes behind the watering can as well. Okay, and I'm just, I can't see it when I'm painting. Make sure that shadow goes around both. And shadows are darkest right next to the form that's casting the shadow. So if you wanna do even one little extra swoop right around it, you can. Now, I just painted over my can. It bled a little bit. So then I just dry it and I'm gonna just sharpen that watering can edge and then we're done. I'm gonna darken some of this while I'm waiting. Put in the little spout holes. There we go. Okay. And then after I put in the edge, I like to dry brush it up so then it doesn't feel like a thick line. You know what I mean? It kind of blends in with the whole thing. And that's it. That's our watering can. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for painting with me. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something and not even just how to paint. We learned about why it's important to have soft flow sometimes when watering your plants and oxidation is... And galvanic reactions. It's metal burning from air. <laughs> from oxygen. From oxygen, which is different. Okay, <laughs> thank you all for painting with me. And um, if you're on Instagram, tag us. We love to see your work. I also love it when you guys ha make your own spin on it. Change this up, change the colors, do whatever you want with this. You are the artist. And I want you to feel empowered to make those decisions, to make it something that is personal to you. Um, we're on Instagram. You can tag us at let's go make art or hashtag let's make art. If you are on Facebook, you can join our watercolor community, super large, but very kind and supportive. That's called let's make art watercolor. People are usually sharing how their projects turned out and then maybe some of their personal work as well. It's a great place to learn, get feedback, find a community, all of that fun stuff. Um, if you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. Michael, thank you for being here. You're very welcome.